And so what I'm going to do is uh, run through a rapid staccato set of points and uh, request you to uh, join us uh, for an elaboration later in the afternoon when we talk about island connectivity. First, let me start, therefore, uh, with an assertion that uh, security is indeed more than military security and maritime issues and maritime security is far greater than the Navy Coast Guard amalgam. Uh, Security has, in fact, maritime security in India has been uh, adequately enunciated right at the apex levels uh, by no less than our prime minister uh, when he says that uh, maritime security is simply freedom from threats that are, can arise either in or from or through the seas. And these threats can be natural or they can be man-made and uh, they can also be combinations of both. And I dare say that this definition of maritime security allows us a much larger scope, uh, A, than is defined only by India, and B, <clears throat> a much larger scope which encompasses and includes the region, because if we do not have inclusive security, then we do not have security. Uh, the Honorable Minister already said that uh, the neighborhood uh, and neighbors are defined not so much anymore by distance, which is a land-centric approach, but really by reach, which is a maritime-centric approach. I want to add two things to this. Uh, one is that in a neighborhood, we must make sure that we have many neighbors and we are able to gently bring across any hoods that we might have. The second is that in order to have neighbors, we must be willing to share. Neighborhood, neighbor, neighborliness is not merely taking, but it is actually the giving. And so what should we share? In establishing connectivities, in, mag, in establishing mega connectivity corridors, what is it that India feels that we should be sharing? First and foremost, simply the knowledge of what's going on. And therefore, we need to be able to have white shipping sharing agreements where white shipping data is available across a much larger scope than we currently do. This, of course, often leads people to think, oh, we have to now do data fusion, we have to go high tech, and we have to do sense making. But I would rather suggest to you that given the disparities that exist in this particular neighborhood of ours in its extended format, as we develop major mega connectivity corridors such as the AAGC, we will encompass a large number of very varying technological, uh, technological advancements. And so we must, while we look at, say, the Singapore model and look at uh, data fusion centers within India, we must also look at low-tech models within connectivity. My third point is that uh, insofar as uh, economic corridors are concerned, adequate amount of space and time will be spent on them. I want to tell you that uh, these mega corridors encompass very rich tapestries. And uh, here you have a, a warp yarn and a weft yarn. And while the warp yarn might well see the presence of many or a few uh, constant um, major powers, it is the weft yarns that give the fabric its pattern. And that's made up of all of us. And unless we can actually pitch in together for the security, we will not have it. So security must be built in right at the very beginning. It's no use trying to get security, holistic security, right at the top when the elevator is already on its way up. It's a very, very difficult thing, and therefore challenges must not take us by surprise. One area of security, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, that I cannot commend to you strongly enough, and which has hardly received even a fraction of the importance that it deserves is the security implications of climate change. These are going to wallop us in our own lifetimes. Let me give you a couple of examples. We are already seeing a far greater increase in the frequency of storms and storm surges and cyclones. And can you not see the impact that this will have as we design ports? and we design multimodal transportation mechanisms when rivers will go into spate, thanks to bore tides and things like that. Another issue, what will happen to baselines as the sea level rise increases? Everybody talks about the Maldives. Let me ask you about Bangladesh or the Philippines. When you have a country whose coastline has receded by several 
tens of kilometers, the baselines from which you made all your maritime zones came to the end of your exclusive economic zones. How will that pan out? Will they now lie 40 kilometers or 50 kilometers away from the coastline? Will that be acceptable? What will then happen to ITLOS? What will happen to UNCLOS? Who is looking at all these issues? Surely it ought to be us, even as we drive mega uh, connectivity corridors. My last point is with regard to uh, capacity versus capability. L let us not forget that while we, while we build these corridors and we develop capacity, I just mean by capacity, material wherewithal. If I give you uh, a port or a boat, you have capacity. Capability is your ability to actually, can you operate the boat, can you maintain the port, can you uh, do a life cycle costing, do you know multimodal transportation mechanisms, do you have training, do you have organizational structures? We may not have capacity. Between us, we may not have enough capacity but we certainly have a very large amount of capability, and we would be imprudent were we to ignore that uh, aspect at all. Finally, uh, with my last 15 seconds running, uh, I want to mention that cultural corridors are equally important. So Project Mossam, which is one of the major corridors that we are seeking, seeks to actually leverage culture and the people-to-people -people contact that these cultures bring, otherwise, the whole concept of a, a mega corridor which restricts itself to purely economic aspects will not be adequate. Thank you very much.